Nick, maybe you can uh, give us your first and last name and a, a little bit about what you do or are working on currently. Um. <laughs> I gotta watch myself. <laughs> I know it's a loaded question. You've been uh, quite the man of mystery. What's my name today? Choose one. Joe Glanis. Okay. Joe, it's nice to have you here. It really is. That means dick nose in Greek. Did I just call you dick? If I did, I only kind of apologize. So I don't know. Nick Spanos. I've been involved in uh, this area for a long time. Uh, part of the end of Fed uh, efforts. I. Uh, I was director of voter contact for Ron Paul and Rand Paul, mm -hmm. and ran all their data and their computers and stuff. And part of the libertarian movement for competing currencies and whatnot. Yeah. Personal liberty, but you guys wouldn't know anything about that. You have quite the the political background in the the 1980s, right? You you were working with with uh, political campaigns and yeah, I had the. First uh, computers on the scene, the political scene, you know. I wrote campaign management software and I sold uh, voter registration data. What did that data do for your campaigns that you ran? I sold uh, labels. I printed labels because no one had a computer, you know. I mean, I had a computer, 78, because I built it with a soldering iron. Couldn't buy any parts or anything. I heard you're, you were 13. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You like a real life Tony Sp Tony Stark? <laughs> a bunch, fi a bunch fatter. Seriously, that that's the first thing that uh, that I thought of. I was like, wow, this this Nick guy's a. Uh... <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't build a suit of armor. Yeah. Gonna need it. Um. So you know, in the past. I mean, I don't know if you want the whole story. I want the whole story, the whole King Caboodle. Or at least what you care to, what's interesting, you know? What makes sense in the context of what you're doing now? Well, listen, everything makes sense to me because of, uh, you know, what uh, the experiences I had in my life. I've always uh, chased down things and uh, you get to a certain place and you realize that, you know, there's someone uh, overinflating something. Mm. Or someone's uh, screwing around with the rules you thought were the rules. So, you know, either be a government overprinting their currency or a stock company diluting their shares, making more shares. Mm -hmm. You know, a company that issues stock, all of a sudden you went from 30% uh, owner to 0.2% owner. Sure. And the other guy's laughing. So, and he got a hold of your patents or something. You know what I mean? So shit like that happens every day. And uh, you know, Ron Paul spoke about competing currencies. The reason why he got into politics was uh, because we came 100% off the gold standard mm -hmm. at the time, uh, in 72 or 73. He, uh, he was a doctor, still a doctor, of course, and um, delivered 4,000 babies. And then... Uh, you know, FDR pretty much made it illegal for anyone to own gold when there was a run on the banks where people were getting redeeming their 
receipts, you know, there were bills for gold. And uh, I mean, back before the Federal Reserve, uh, of course, there were, bill there were uh, notes and they were redeemable in gold and 20 bucks was an ounce of gold, a $20 bill gave, gave you an ounce of gold. And uh, you'd have to go to the bank that issued a piece of paper and go get your gold if you wanted. Yeah. Then people got, you know, very used to the paper. They didn't really need the gold. So, mentally. And then some uh, fancy guy said, hey, we're going to do an ICO. We're going to call it the Federal Reserve Note. And uh, we're going to loosely associate ourselves with gold. Where at one point we can, like, get ourselves totally off the gold standard. And one of the guys probably said, well, why is that going to work? I mean, uh, why would anyone use our bills? They got all these other ones to get gold with. He goes, well, we're going to invent the IRS on the same day, and if they don't collect a bunch of our tokens, mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve note, and give it back to us, creating upward pressure, people needing those tokens, we'll lock them in jail. We'll put them in a cage. That's upward pressure. So pretty much uh, that's what happened. And um, 73, Nixon took us off the gold standard altogether because it was $80 billion worth of paper that we were supposed to trans uh, exchange with the France and a bunch of other countries because that was the only part of the, uh, the redeemability that was still left on the tables between countries mm -hmm. and not for an individual. And uh, we didn't have that much gold, so he took us off the gold standard because we didn't have the gold to pay. So that was it. And uh, Ron Paul went into office because of that. Ran for office. And, uh, you know, we found him and uh, helped promote him. And, uh, I mean, he's just, you know, he's just an honest, you know, country doctor. And that's it. And... Uh, you know, we use the internet to pass the word around. Mm -hmm. These money bombs, we raised $4.3 million one day on November 5th, 2007. Uh, December 6th, 2007, we raised $6.4 $6 million. Called them money bombs. And uh, it was our inspiration. Many of the uh, early adopters of Bitcoin we're all staffers, as a matter of fact. Uh, David Johnson is an uh, early staffer. He ran uh, Louisiana in the primary. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned prior that you know you kind of were at the forefront of developing, you know, uh, computerized software to facilitate, control, manage campaign data. Um, well, was that just an effort that you took? Was that an initiative that you had on your own? Did you have a, a team? Yeah, I mean, I had a computer and uh, no one else did, so I was looking for ways to make money off of it. What was the, what was the first way that, that you found? Uh, I don't remember. I think it was, uh, uh, well, you know what I did? I did uh, I helped do the books, like some accounting. Mm. Uh, I helped do, uh, I wrote software that um, ran real estate offices and uh, video rental stores. <laughs> Back when video was, was alive and well and thriving, right? Yeah, well, it was early too. And video just gotten the masses, you had Betamax and VHS. Mm -hmm. So there was a field that said type, either beta or VHS. Yeah. You yeah, populated it right. with. Because you had to, people had to decide which one was going to be adapted. Well, depending on what machine they had at home, you know? Yeah. So you'd go to the video store and ask for a videotape for a beta or a laser disc. Well, that's kind of like the same situation that's happening now within the blockchain landscape, right? In terms of technology, it's which blockchain 
do you develop on? Which blockchain will be the blockchain of the future, the VHS <laughs> of, you know, of blockchain technology moving forward? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Only the future can tell, yeah. I mean, it looks like Ethereum has a lot of uh, developers on it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't like the EVM, you know, the Ethereum virtual machine. And uh, some people have called it, I'm not going to say I've called it that, <laughs> but JavaScript money. So. I've heard that quite well, You never know. I've been called that once or twice. Okay. You well, never know. You never know. You never know. You don't know what's going to happen. Thing is could weird. be Bitcoin. Bitcoin could be the smart contract. Mm. Extraordinaire soon. It's probably going to be Bitcoin. You really believe that? Bitcoin? Okay. We've had a lot of discussions with a lot of people running companies, founders, so to speak, building blockchain technologies on top of these different blockchains and it's really hard to get a gauge of where they come from you know is, are they here in the space for money are they here in the space to really adapt and bring this thing forward or is it a combination of both so I'm curious because you know I, I can ask you about Bitcoin Center and maybe you can give me more about that but you know from your work in the political landscape from the 1980s all the way to basically where you are now was is, was there a consistent motivation for you aside you know money aside yeah, well, of course, it was all money aside. I mean, we're, I was here when, you know, you went broke when you were in uh, Bitcoin. Um, I'm not here for the, for the money. I'm here for the, for the freedom. I'm here for what, it, uh, you know, uh, this trust, peer-to-peer -peer trust network can offer humanity. And uh, I'm here to make sure it happens. I remember uh, we were trading Bitcoin in a park. And uh, well, you know, then we went to Whole Foods, like the same guys. It was, it was, uh, it was okay. It was, um, you know, there was a hopefulness feeling yeah. to the, this competing currency taking hold and the decentralization uh, taking hold. And, uh, you know, uh, most were anarchists, crypto, not crypto, uh, anarcho capitalists, mm -hmm. crypto anarchists, uh, libertarian. Types all were. Yeah. You know, I think just on this last run, did all the West Coast uh, crowdfunders, communists show up? They'll be gone when the money's gone. Yeah. For a little while, they won't make it to a dull drum. But uh, they won't make it through. You know, dull drums. So They'll we'll try to find some other. I'll still be here, of course. We'll all, you know, many, most will still be here. I'm just saying many who came in, uh, you know, like miners, gold miners, prospectors from the 1800s, <laughs> and their descendants. Well, you had your when own mining gold company. gold dries up. Didn't you? You had your own mining company? Yeah, we were mining, <laughs> yeah. No, I meant the... Uh, you know, West Coast uh, crowdfunders. I don't know, we just call them West Coast crowdfunders. The West Coasters. Crowdfunders. West Coast. Right, they were on the, I don't know, those sites where you beg people for money. For your They're directing. not doing it on the streets anymore, they're doing it in the websites. Yeah. Yeah. Like Did go you fund go yourself, yeah. whatever it's called.